Hey Wargamers, the internet has been ablaze since Thursday night when someone hopped on Reddit and posted this image of a cat, and also a book that very much looks to be the new Tau Empire Codex. Now, they then answered a ton of questions, including rules and points and a bunch of details about what's in that book. And so it seems like the cat's kind of out of the bag, more or less, right? They didn't give us the entirety of the codex by any means, uh, but they gave us a lot of information. And so it's probably a pretty good indicator of the way the codex is going, assuming it's all legit, assuming this person didn't, uh, you know, completely Photoshop this image, and also that they uh, were truthful in what they were posting into the comment thread, right? It's totally, totally possible that they uh, actually do have the book, but then just were making stuff up to, to mess with people as they went. Uh, no way to know yet, but uh, let's just take this at face value. Now, before we get into it, I do want to say that I wish this leak hadn't have happened. And that's for two reasons. One is because whoever is doing this leak, again, assuming it's legitimate, uh, came about their book through dishonest means. I'm not a fan of that, but the information's out there, so we might as well talk about it. The second bit is that I kind of feel like a kid who has opened their Christmas present a month early. Right, We know the Codex is coming soon. Along with that is a bunch of previews, a bunch of anticipation, speculation, just entertainment and fun that could be had in the process leading up to the Codex. If this is real, we can't have that now. We know what's in the book, and the, the present is open, sitting on the floor, and there's no mystery. There's no anticipation or spectacle anymore. But uh, I'm still excited about the Codex. I'm still excited about the rules, and uh, I really want to want to talk about it even though we've gotten here in a way very different from what I would have preferred. All right, so without further ado, the top five paradigm shifts that are very likely in the new Tau Codex. All right, so let's start off with something that I'm pretty excited about, one of the more flavorful changes that I noticed in this leak, and that is how Games Workshop has reimagined the roles of commanders inside the Tau army. Now, right now, commanders are pretty monotone, right? You can take an XVA, you can take an Enforcer, you can take a Cold Star Commander, and they all do basically the same thing, right? They all uh, shoot pretty well, and they can uh, give buffs via stratagems. And that's great, that's very useful, uh, but there's not a lot of variation between those two, with the exception of the Cold Star, which of course is a fast boy, it doesn't change much about how your army actually functions as a whole or how you design your army. That all changes in this leak. Uh, the leak says that uh, based on the commander you take, your army is going to function pretty differently. Uh, for example, there's a buff that they can give out to crisis suits in the command phase. Uh, if you take an XVA commander, it allows a nearby crisis unit to shoot and charge after it's fallen back, basically giving it the old fly keyword plus a little extra, which is certainly useful. Uh, the enforcer gives objective secure to a unit. Um, and that's something I am super excited to see. That's something that I've talked about in videos as being something that we need for the army. And so I'm, I'm stoked to see that as an option here and have it being delivered by a commander. Feels good. It feels fluffy. It feels flavorful. And, uh, yeah, that hits the spot right there. Uh, the cold star too, uh, it gives an eight inch advance to a unit nearby, which means that you have easy peasy Monka range, right? There's there's other things in this leak that help facilitate Monka, but having that eight inch advance just flat, uh, that works, right? And and even if this is wrong, if there's some caveats here that we're missing, right? Just having a reliable eight inch advance, uh, if you're going with Monka, is really awesome because again, remember that advance doesn't really count, uh, right? When you're doing Monka, you count as staying stationary in the beginning of the game. So uh, that is super useful. On top of that, each of these commanders has their own type of special abilities. One of the things that seems to be ubiquitous across the commanders is that they unlock the ability to take a bodyguard unit without using up an elite slot in your force org chart, which is good on its own, right? That elite slots are highly contentious it seems like that's not going to change, especially with the emphasis on battle suits in this new codex. So having the ability to take bodyguards as something outside the force org chart really is quite powerful on its own. 
On top of that, though, enforcers have the ability to reduce damage by one. Uh, that's useful. It makes sense because they're kind of, you know, they're chunk, they're chunky boys. Uh, so maybe they take a little less damage. That's cool. And then cold stars have a redeploy move. So kind of like the old Yvara, you know, jump up in the sky and then come back down. They have the ability to redeploy now in a way that, uh, they can, you know, hop from one side of the board to the other. And, and avoid being shot at in the in the meantime too, which is uh, an added perk that does make up for a, you know a little a little tiny nerf um, in the way that cold stars only move fourteen now um, they don't get to move uh, across the board on their own on their own two jets now uh, which again makes sense given the changes in the design of the of the army makes sense given the way that Monka is working uh, so. I, I'm fine with that, and frankly, the way that they've designed commanders now, I wouldn't want a cold star running off with a bunch of drones to the other side of the board. I want to hang it out with my crisis suits. So, cool, fine, 14 inches, great. Uh, I'll take it. There's also been a soft nerf on taking duplicates of any given weapon. So this is true for crisis suits and also for commanders. Uh, but basically, if you want to take, let's say, all fusion blasters, you're going to be paying much more for that third fusion blaster than you did for that first fusion blaster. That means that crisis suits, commanders are going to be you know, promoted to have more diverse layouts. Uh, if you're able to take multiple different weapons, uh, pay less for those weapons, you're potentially going to be more efficient if you can find overlapping niches between those weapons. And this is a surprising solution to one of the problems we've also talked about in the past, particularly regarding things like the plasma rifle. The plasma rifle has historically been a challenging weapon choice because it just doesn't have a niche. However, that suddenly becomes an advantage under this new rule set because not having a niche, doing the same thing as a different weapon, uh, even if it's slightly less good at that thing, means that you can take multiple weapons for cheap and have that niche overlap between the different weapons allow you to perform the same role you would as if you had taken multiples of a single weapon. So you can have cost savings by taking several different but closely related weapons in a way that makes you more effective and uh, a little bit more versatile too because you do have that flexibility between the different weapons. So I like this. I think it's cool. It 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 works in a way that yeah means that you can't totally specialize in the way you might want to uh, or at least do so cheaply but uh, promotes this idea of having crisis suits with multiple different weapons just like you see in the art, just like you hear about in the lore, just like you used to do when Tau were first introduced, right? Tau used to always, I would always run my crisis suits with a plasma rifle and a missile pod. Uh, this seems like it's pushing us back in that direction, which I like. I, I would much prefer having more complex units that play well compared to using just the same weapons over and over and over again. Um, I think that's just more fun. And if the rules are able to make that an optimal choice, Perfect. So let's go in that direction, and I'm I am excited to see that. Next, let's talk about drones. Drones are one of the more characteristic components of the Tau Empire army, and over the history of the faction, they've had a variety of incarnations in terms of how they actually function. Their current iteration is a bit problematic in that one saber protocols makes them not very fun to play against. Right, the ability to uh, condense a ton of damage down to a single moral wound doesn't really feel appropriate uh, and it's not fun to play against. Uh, and uh, because of that, drones are very hard to balance, especially considering the diversity of units that can benefit from Seder, Saber protocols from any given drone. So you have a wide number of variables to consider when balancing them and you're bound to get it wrong. The leak suggests that the new codex gets around both of those things by basically removing saver protocols and having drones attached to the unit or at least part of the unit that purchased them, assuming we're not talking about tactical drones, right? So if you purchase drones as an upgrade, it's not a separate unit anymore. It is now part of that same unit, which does a very elegant job of addressing multiple issues that we just talked about. In the absence of the savior protocol mechanic, 
Drones are now just another model that has wounds inside the unit, and so they act to prevent damage on your battlesuits, for example, by soaking wounds directly. They don't have the complicated mechanic of uh, having a unit shoot at a unit and then shift the damage to a different unit and then condense that damage on a roll, right? It, we don't have to deal with that anymore. It's just there's some extra wounds in that unit, and you can do with them as you please. It does sound like the Codex has a version of the old Seer Protocols available in the form of a stratagem, which is of course restricted by being a stratagem, meaning that you can only use it once per phase and you have to have the CP to do it, so potentially much more balanced in that way. Um, This all means that really you're using your attached drones, your upgrade drones, as defensive things, and your tactical drone units, your separate or independent drone units, really are not useful for defense at all. They are strictly offensive units. So tactical drones shift from being something where you're taking them just to you know have wounds to protect your riptide, for example. Um, and instead, you're taking tactical drones now for board control or a little bit extra firepower, a little bit extra marker light support with those gun drones and marker drones actually doing the things that they are designed to do, but then having maybe some shield drones in there just to add a little bit of bulk and durability to the unit as a whole. But even for drones that are attached to a unit, there's a somewhat reduced defensive value to them. One of this, one of the reasons for this is that Saber Protocols is no longer condensing multi-damage down to a single mortal wound. And for gun drones, marker drones, which have one wound, that's not a big deal because it doesn't matter if you do 10 damage, they're still just going to take the one wound. But for shield drones, which we now know have two wounds, that is a big deal, right? That that they are much less valuable now in that regard because if it gets hit with a two, three, four damage shot, uh, that could potentially be it for that model. So shield drones in particular are less valuable here than they have been in the past. Um, it also means that you need to bring a bunch of drones for that particular unit. You can't rely on supplemental drones from tactical drones or from other units. You have to bring the drones you need for that crisis suit unit, for that riptide, for that broadside unit. Um, And so you're going to have to bulk up on drones, which isn't necessarily bad, but it does leave you vulnerable to things like blast, right? It makes it harder to position. It makes a lot of things more complicated when you're dealing with one large unit as opposed to two smaller units. Um, So there are some complexities that arise because of this shift that probably are more fair, but also mean that drones themselves are just less effective in the defensive lane. Counteract this to some extent, the buffs that drones give their units seem to be pretty good in at least a few cases. So we know that pulse accelerator drones make uh, pulse weapons in that unit have minus one AP. That's a pretty good buff, especially if we're thinking about pathfinders, which might have carbines and aren't going to be receiving a minus one AP natively, as we know from the official uh, Warhammer community preview. Another example is stealth drones. Stealth drones make the target not targetable uh, outside 18 inches. So that's massive, right? If you just can't shoot at the thing outside 18 inches, that is very good. Um, And so having the lower durability component of drones offset by this potentially very valuable offensive ability uh, seems to make sense. I think overall this makes for much more simplified gameplay and means that you have fewer units on the board on top of that, right? Like we don't have all these like two man units of gun drones running around trying to do saber protocols, trying to shoot their, you know, little carbines here and there. And all that just slows down the game in a way that can be really frustrating. Uh, So we don't have to deal with all these little piddly units. We just have our big blocks of drones in with the units that they're meant to protect. It's straightforward. It's simple. There's no confusion. It's very uh, easy to manage. And I like that. Next up, let's talk about marker lights. Now, marker lights are one of the things we've been really curious about how they were going to function in the new codex. And this leak makes it sound like marker lights are going to be pretty functional in the new iteration. Uh, Basically, I think Games Workshop hit this one on the head. Uh, Previously, marker lights were an issue because they were clunky and, you know, inconsistently valuable at best. But they've solved both those issues in this iteration of the marker light. 
They do that by making marker lights an action. So any unit that has a marker light can perform the marker light action. Um, so you can do it with any number of units. It's not restricted to just one. Um, and that action starts at the beginning of the movement phase and goes till the beginning of the shooting phase. Basically, it means that you're aiming the laser at your target and you can't move during your movement phase. And that's cool. That makes sense. Great. Um, it also has a consequence of meaning that you can fire other weapons, right? If this resolves at the beginning of shooting phase, you can still fire your carbine or whatever else you have uh, on top of doing the marker light, which kind of makes sense too thematically that the, the laser pointer is going to be deployed prior to shooting, not at the same time of shooting. So that totally works for me too. There is a modification to the timing of that action for Pathfinders though. Pathfinders have the ability to start the action at the end of their movement phase as opposed to the beginning, which means that they can move, fire their marker lights, and then fire their other weapons all in the same turn, which is really powerful uh, and means that Pathfinders are really the preferred marker light platform compared to other things like, let's say, marker drones, at least as far as we can tell here. This is because Pathfinders are able to get line of sight on targets that would otherwise not be able to be targeted by marker lights, right? The, the default action means that you have to have line of sight to a target uh, ahead of time. So either you have to have yourself positioned correctly in your previous turn or your opponent has to walk out into the open uh, in their turn. This allows you to maneuver around that and actually get line of sights on obscured or, you know, hard to hit targets, which is really, really important, especially in such a dynamic game. So having this means that Pathfinders clearly have a role in your army, even if they die quickly, even if they aren't necessarily uh, the best in any other aspect, they are clearly the best marker light platform based on this leak. Plus, they have all those upgrade sprues, and we don't know exactly how all those upgrades work from the kill team box, but at least some of them are probably going to be pretty good. So Pathfinders are looking like, yeah, they might actually be a staple of your army going forward. Once the action resolves, you're basically just shooting a marker light at a three up. So you can still split, you can still have, you know, five different marker lights hit five different targets lines. They're all visible and eligible to be targeted. Um, but you're rolling on a three up and if you hit it, then it gets a marker light token. And that's actually pretty awesome because it means you're getting all your marker lights on threes now, uh, which is certainly better than before, normally hitting on a four. So this is a more elegant system, right? You don't have to worry about, oh, did I remember to reroll my ones or anything like that? It's just you're hitting on a three, end of story. And if you do it, then you get a marker light token. Great. Um, once you have those marker light tokens on a unit, uh, you spend them just in the way that you have in previous editions. You spend those marker light tokens. And for each token you expend, you can give a unit firing at it plus one to hit. So you might want to have multiple marker light tokens on a unit if you're firing at it with multiple other units. Uh, if you're only firing at it with one unit, then you only need the one marker light hit. But if you're trying to fight, you know, fire your whole army at it, then you'll want a bunch of them. So this means that marker lights are always useful and don't have a bunch of, you know, meaningless or, you know, intermittently valuable benefits that you're just not going to use, right? This means that it's always going to be a good thing to have a marker light on a target, even if uh, you don't have seeker missiles or even if they're not in cover. Like this is a much more elegant, much more impactful system and a welcome change that I'm very excited about in the new codex. Okay, so the changes to drones, the changes to marker lights, I think are both pretty welcome changes and overall improvements, things that will go over fairly well with the player base. Something that might not be as popular is that uh, all the Psychic Awakening Farsight Enclave stuff, not in the book. Uh, so that means no more Veteran Cadre, no more the Eight, no more Fusion Blades. All those things are gone. Uh, at least they're not accessible to you using this codex. So um, let's break that down piece by piece. One is that, yeah, no more Veteran Cadre. Veteran Cadres were awesome because they made your Crisis Suits have Ballistic Skill 3 up, and we love that. Um, but it's not necessarily that big of a deal because of the way the marker lights work now, right? Marker lights uh, hit uh, give you a 3 up pretty easily. Uh, as opposed to the kind of the 
hoops you had to run through before in order to get plus one ballistic skill. Now you just need one marker light and you got it. So that works. Um, on top of that, the Farsight Enclave buff uh, or Septenant allows you to, again, have a marker light if you're within 12 inches. So you're going to have that three up on Crisis Suits a lot of the time, whether you're firing marker lights or not. So it's it's an, a downgrade, yes, but not necessarily that bad. And having three up on all your crisis suits as opposed to just a single unit uh, is you know probably better. So I think that yeah, this this hurts. It doesn't feel as good, but it probably actually makes for stronger armies overall. Having the eight not in the codex is just part of the pattern at this point, right? Like every time they've introduced the the eight now, they have subsequently ignored them in the next codex. So. I would wager that the eight are never actually going to show up in a main Tau Empire Codex. They're always going to be a fringe thing. They're always going to be their own deal outside of the book. Uh, so there's a pattern at this point. I don't know, maybe Games Workshop needs to talk to someone about their issues with the eight and work through it. But yeah, we're, uh, I'm not surprised that the eight aren't in the book. Uh, next up is Fusion Blades. Uh, all the other war gear from Psychic Awakening Farsight Enclaves is gone too. Uh, but, you know, again, that's kind of part of the pattern that like Warscaper drones, uh, not, not something that shows up in the codex. That's something that's special for the other book that they make you buy. So, okay, fine. Uh, Fusion Blades in particular, though, I think would have been very strong. The new iteration of the Onager Gauntlet, uh, is pretty good as well. Um, and, you know, is not not the same as Fusion Blades, but gets you pretty close. The thing about Fusion Blades would have been that if you had a commander with Fusion Blades, they would have been able to, uh, you know, hack and slash uh, in the melee phase with Fusion and also fire Fusion in the shooting phase in combat. So they're actually having a really high close combat output because of that. And Again, you have some of that with the Onager Gauntlet too, so it's not like there isn't an option for that. But having two options, certainly Fusion Blades and the Onager Gauntlet, might be a little much. So you, you, you can't blame Games Workshop for not <laughs> throwing that in there in the in the Tau Codex. But again, part of this pattern, I think it's pretty clear Games Workshop is going to be releasing Farsight Enclave's rules in an upcoming season. Again, remember we have seasons now. We're we're touring the cosmos different places, different themes. One of those themes is probably going to be Farsight Enclaves, and we're going to get new rules for Farsight Enclaves, including all these things that we don't have anymore. Uh, and you guessed it, you'll probably have to pay some money for it. So um, yeah, that's just kind of how it goes at this point. Fine. Uh, but one of the silver linings to that is that if they do a Farsight Enclaves theme book, then that's a pretty good opportunity for a new Farsight model, and he needs one. So we've talked about this before. We've talked about our our surprise that the new model was Darkstrider and not Farsight. Maybe this is the reason. They're holding on to Farsight for a new book to come out, and when they do that, they'll give you the new Farsight model, and uh, everyone will be really excited about that, including me. There's also some pretty big changes to how Overwatch is featured in the army. Now, historically, Tau have been pretty good at Overwatch because of things like For the Greater Good or Supporting Fire. We've been able to fire tons of Overwatch all the time and have our friends help us, but that's no longer the case. Uh, instead, Overwatch is something that we no longer get for free. We have to use a stratagem like every other faction when firing Overwatch, and that means that we're limited to one unit firing Overwatch per phase. Uh, that itself is a big drawback. However, uh, there is a little bit of a, of a compensation for this, if you will. Uh, you're able to take early warning override on some battle suits, and if you do that, the CP cost for that is reduced by one. So you're able to, you know, get a little bit back that way, but you still have to play the stratagem. That doesn't prevent you from having to use the stratagem and doesn't mean that you can use the stratagem multiple times. So yeah, early warning override is likely going to be a pretty good choice in some cases, but isn't something that's going to mean that you have overwatch the way you used to. On top of this, for the greater good is gone. Right? You can't help your buddies out anymore with Overwatch. It's every unit for themselves, and that makes sense given the fact that Overwatch isn't free for us anymore. It wouldn't really make sense 
for a unit to have to pay a CP um, if they're being charged, but not pay a CP to fire Overwatch if they were just next to somebody being charged. So I think that makes sense and it's fine. All of this feels very different, especially if you are from the perspective that Overwatch is one of the best things about Tau. Um, I've never been of that perspective uh, as far as I can remember. Uh, And I view this more as a net gain than anything at all because we got massive shooting buffs, right? We've seen this in the profiles that have been previewed. We've seen this in various different formats that Tau shooting is stronger than it has been in a very long time. Uh, And we also know that battle suits get to shoot an assault. So we've shored up our uh, shooting ability. We've allowed us some impact in melee, um, not necessarily a dominant impact. There's a lot of caveats about how well that's going to work, but we can still do something, right? And that was a big issue. Uh, So those are both big wins. Overwatch going away, or at least just not being as effective for Tau, is really small compared to both of those massive wins. And Overwatch was was and should never have been the goal of an army, right? You don't want to be charged as Tau. You shouldn't be in a situation where you get charged as Tau, or at least you don't want to be in that situation. And so, you know, being better at something that you don't really want to do in the first place uh especially when it's you know relying on fives or sixes to hit is not very valuable right like the the amount of change in a game that Overwatch made compared to either of these other two buffs this is hands down a much better design for the army overall compared to relying on the gimmick of having Overwatch be more of a thing for Tau because they don't like being touched like this is just better design and it means for simplified gameplay right tau's strength is shooting not being charged right as much as the the art team wants you to think that uh well i mean maybe maybe the art team is on the ball here right whenever you see tau and art in close combat it's going very poorly for them uh right so they really are trying to emphasize that the strength of the tau empire is shooting not being charged and this change to overwatch reinforces that message and Yeah, it feels different, but I'm totally fine with it. So those are the top five paradigm shifts that I could see in this leak. And for the most part, I think they're pretty good. I think they're good design choices, and I'm excited to see how this plays out on the tabletop. Of course, there was a lot more stuff in this leak, and there will inevitably be much more detail in the actual codex and in the previews that Games Workshop has planned for us in the weeks or months to come. So I am going to be doing a lot of in-depth analysis on those previews on the codex when I actually have it in hand. Uh, I won't be trying to reconstruct the uh, the codex from these leaks because, uh, frankly, they're, they're kind of all over the place, and I much prefer just to have the actual book in my hand uh, amongst all the other reasons we already talked about. So stay tuned. Subscribe for that. If you want to see more of these in-depth discussions of the Tau Empire, they will surely be coming. Um, and, yeah, let me know what you think in the comments below. What do you think about these you know, paradigm shifts, as I'm calling them. Do you think they're good? Do you think they're bad? What things do you want to see in the codex and which things uh, were you disappointed not to see mentioned here today? Uh, Whatever it is, put it in the comments below. I'd love to have a discussion about it. Thanks again. And as always, happy wargaming. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. A while ago I made my own miniature, and if you too want to be the proud owner of an invasive wargaming model, you can check out the link in the description below. Down there you will also find links for the Invasive Wargaming Discord server and the Invasive Wargaming Patreon. Really, this channel wouldn't be possible without the support of my patrons. Special thanks to Marcy, A Little Pink Monster, Benaby Jones, Durza, Ever Keller, Robbie Goodwin, Jose Gomez, Ruger, Drew Pratley, Michael Byrne, Zealous Brimstone, Scott Heater, Stephen Cowan, Jared Egler, Chris Kessler, and Tao as well.